Hi, I'm Dr Liz O'Riordan and I'm thrilled to be talking to Melanie Hodson from Hospice UK on behalf of Working With Cancer. Melanie, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Hello, it's lovely to meet you and thank you for having me. Um, so my name is Melanie Hodson. I'm Head of Information Support and have worked um, for Hospice UK for several decades now, actually, um, mainly supporting people's information needs, be those from members of the public or those with a professional interest in, in hospice care in the UK. Thank you very much. Now, can you tell us about Hospice UK? What is its purpose and whereabouts are you based? Um, well, we're the national charity for hospice and end-of-life care, and our work is all about ensuring that everyone affected by um, dying, death and grief gets the care and support they need when they need it. Um, we are London-based, but UK in our coverage. Brilliant. Now, what is your relationship with individual hospices? Because I know there are so many dotted all over the country. Are they all automatically part of Hospice UK? Um, there's a membership scheme there, but there's over 200 hospices which are members um, of Hospice UK. And that's the vast majority of hospices um, throughout the four nations of the UK as well. Brilliant. Thank you. And a lot of people might not know this, but what are the main services that you provide to those who are seriously ill and their families? Is it purely hospice based or do you go out into the community as well? Well, I think that there's two things there. I think there's the work that we do as Hospice UK and then there's the work that hospices, our members do as well. So I'll start with the work that we do. And there's quite a lot of it. So um, I'll try and be succinct in that. Um, I think first and foremost, we are here to support hospices to deliver the brilliant and compassionate care um, that they provide to everyone who needs end of life support. Um, and we're very much about championing hospices, expert and free care that, that helps people's um, with their illnesses and also supports the NHS as well. Um, you might know that hospices themselves support more than 300,000 people every year. Um, mm -hmm. And that's way beyond people just coming to an inpatient unit, which is often the association that people tend to make with hospice care. So you may well know that hospices provide care in the community. They have bereavement support services, and that extends also to families um, and the loved ones of those who are receiving hospice care themselves. Um, additionally, we work with national governments and local communities to make sure that um, hospices have the right resources and support so that they can look after those who need that, that um, help at the end of their lives. We also support the mental and emotional well-being of hospice nurses and frontline staff. And we do that through courses in compassionate management, um, resilience training and peer support groups. Um, in a similar vein, we also have national knowledge sharing networks and events to help hospital, hospital, hospice clinical staff, <laughs> get my words right, um, to, to troubleshoot problems, to learn from each other and share the latest innovations in the field. We're also working through things like Dying Matters campaign and the Cash Compassionate Employers programme to really open up public conversations around death and dying. Um, and it's, it, that's all about breaking down those taboos in the area um, and helping people have important conversations um, about what matters to them, about death, dying, grief, um, and also providing um, advice resources online to do that as well. Um, and if you visit our website, you'll see there's a, a wealth of information um, which is intended for members of the public, just to give them an introduction bit by bit to what hospice care is and how to access it. It's an incredible amount of information, isn't it, that the Hospice UK provides? We do a tremendous amount um, and have a fabulous team doing that. It's so good to know. Is hospice care only delivered within a hospice? No. As I was saying previously, I think there's a, there yeah. is a strong association in people's minds that a hospice is a building, is an inpatient unit, whereas in fact there's a lot more that makes up hospice care that people can access. So, for example, there are daycare support services that hospices provide, um, so you don't have to be admitted as an inpatient to access that support mm -hmm. from the multidisciplinary team. So that sort of tends in a daycare environment to concentrate on things like well-being, um, there might be drop-in sessions, um, there might be clinic appointments for to, to help with particular symptoms. Um, it could also be yoga or um, getting involved in creative therapies, um, Art and music therapies are very much part and parcel of, what, of what's on offer as well. Then, of course, there is the inpatient care as well. Um, 
it, it can be that people are admitted to a hospice for a, a spell of time, typically 10 to 14 days, to help manage symptoms. And when they reach a point that, that can be, they can be safely looked after elsewhere, then they will be transferred to another care setting or back home, and then may be readmitted for inpatient care as they need it. And that inpatient care is very much about managing complex um, symptoms, be they physical or um, sort of psychological. Um, and it could be for rehab after a treatment, or it could be for symptoms such as um, um, pain, nausea, vomiting, that sort of thing. Um, and then so as alluding to people may be admitted back into a hospice inpatient unit later in their, their illness um, for support towards the end of their lives. Um, I think it's also worth pointing out that hospices will also try very hard to accommodate um, family members and relatives um, with a room overnight so that people can be close together at such an important time. There's also outpatient services. Oh, I haven't finished this later. Wow, this is, this is amazing. I, um, yeah, as there's a doctor, I just thought, sorry, go on. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll be quick. Um, no, so fine. yeah, That's outpatient fine. services will happen. There's hospice at home services, and there are also virtual wards which can support people um, at home um, and mean that they won't have to have a hospital or hospice admission necessarily. So yeah, I think I whizzed through that super quick. But I, as a junior doctor, I just thought hospices were where people went to die. And then when my mum was poorly, it was amazing knowing there were outreach nurses who could call and check up on her. And I got bereavement counselling. They they are amazing spaces. Now, one question, we've kind of covered this. A lot of people think that palliative care means end of life. You're in your final mm. days, weeks, hours. And a lot of doctors and nurses do as well, as well as the general public. Can you explain to us the difference between palliative and end of life? Yes, briefly, um, I'd say that the palliative care can be available at a very early stage, um, shortly after diagnosis sometimes, um, and can continue alongside um, other treatments to support that condition. So I think the important thing to realise for people is that being referred for palliative care doesn't necessarily mean that you're coming towards the very end of your life. It means the support that they can offer is likely to be beneficial to you at that point in your illness. And then I think um, then the distinction comes in, and I think that's where people get more um, blurred in their thinking, is the end of life care aspect, um, which is that support that's offered to people um, who are approaching the end of their lives. And quite often that's considered to be um, those who are thought to be in the last year of their lives. Yeah, brilliant. And it's not just for cancer patients, is it? Because that's another myth that people believe. Um, um, so no, um, the I think there was an association back when hospice care first started that there was a strong association with cancer care, but now it's very much about supporting people um, whose condition is likely to benefit from the, the treatment and support that hospices can offer. Um, so, so yeah, the, breaking that association between cancer and hospice care is, is really important. So kind of anyone with a long-term condition that is going to affect them that will deteriorate in time Hospice is there to provide support whenever they need it. And even respite, I guess. If your care is needed a break, you may be able to go in just for... Yes, indeed. Some hospices do have um, dedicated respite beds and support available. Um, and also, as I hope I've indicated, mm. hospice care itself is very much about supporting um, those who find them with cells with caring responsibilities for somebody as, just as much as it is for the patient themselves. And that's so important. So that we might have covered this, but at what stage do you start to provide support to people and their families? Do you have to wait until the doctor said you've only got a couple of months left to live or could it be at a much earlier beginning of their treatment? I think if it hasn't been mentioned by somebody who has that medical oversight um, of a patient, but perhaps you feel it could be helpful because you've seen family members benefit from it, then it's worth asking that question. Um, to your care team say you know is this something that can help me um, and then have that conversation brilliant because I think as a doctor it's hard to remember everything you need to tell someone when they are diagnosed and saying well did you know this and often just saying the words hospice can be terrifying because you think they've written me off oh my goodness yes can the general public refer themselves in if they're concerned can you call them um, 
Yes, some hospices will take um, direct self-referrals. Um, others say, actually, we do need it to come from somebody who has, who's a health or social care professional who has that yeah. oversight of need. Um, where there are self-referrals, the, the hospice would still want to have a chat um, at the next point with yeah. somebody like the doctor to, to make sure that the care that they could offer would be appropriate at that point. But um, yeah, strongly encourage people to get in touch with their local hospice and find out what they can do. And they can tell you who you need to call, what you need to do to make it happen, because it can be daunting when they say talk to the GP and we know how difficult it can be to get seen. So you can always ring for help if you're concerned, either as a patient or about a family member, I guess. Always worth contacting a hospice to find out what their referral process is and they can then talk that through with you um, and answer any questions that you might have. I think we've briefly covered the form that support takes, but I just wanted to go over it's it's not just for the patients. And it's not just for the families and the support doesn't end if somebody dies, does it? No, absolutely. So, yes, we've touched on the fact that it is pain and symptom control. Um, we've talked or I may have alluded the psychological support and social support. So helping with practical issues, um, getting welfare um, advice and benefits advice. Um, it's companionship um, to support people who are living at home. There's spiritual care. There might be short break care, um, especially for, for people who have um, children living with life limiting conditions. Um, complementary therapies so yeah a whole range of rehabilitation as well so it's a big mix that is really that summarizes the whole heart of hospice care is that it's about looking at the person as a whole and I think what differentiates hospice care most clearly when you think about being in a healthcare environment is you'll know that people ask you what's the matter with you and hospice care is about what matters to you as the question so that, that I think really gives you the sense of um, hospices seeing person as a whole and recognizing that there are people close to them who will benefit from that support and as you say on into bereavement support once somebody has died. I love that. I remember a friend of mine did a placement in a hospice when she was training to be a doctor. Mm. And she said, I just feel I'm actually helping the person. It's proper yeah. holistic care. It is mind, body and soul. And it's you as a unit with the people who love you. Absolutely. And feeling of wow. And it, it sounds like Nirvana and everyone wants to go there, but that's not possible. We'll come to that in a minute. But I just wanted to touch on the bereavement counselling because I I didn't think I could get it because mum didn't need a hospice. She was too poorly to go into one and I felt guilty. But the fact they said, no, it's fine. You don't need to have had someone use the hospice or even die in the hospice. But we offer bereavement counselling. Yes, some hospices do have um, bereavement support services which extend to the wider community, meaning that you don't have to have been known to the hospice previously yeah. in order to access that support. So that is certainly true for, for some hospices. Mm -hmm. Equally, um, uh, I have people come to me saying, oh, well, my dad died in the northeast of England, but I live in Wales. Um, mm -hmm. Does that mean I can't? But often there are reciprocal relationships, which mean the hospices will be able to support support you, even if you're not close to the hospice Everyone. that provided that care. It's always worth asking. Thank you. Yeah. Can you continue working if you're having hospice care? Um, I think that depends. Um, I think everyone's experience is different. So some people might be working when they start receiving hospice care. Whether they continue to do that will be um, a personal choice as, as much as it is a practical one, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so there are some people who are going to receive hospice care, like pain and symptom control or complementary therapies, whatever it might be, and that can support them to live as well as they can um, mm -hmm. for the time being. But ultimately, deciding whether they're going to to stop work or um, continue is going to be up to that individual and they're going to obviously have to factor in things like treatment regimes um, which might need dedicated time for them the treatment itself might be quite tiring debilitating um, so you find that perhaps somebody's first thoughts about how they might want to engage with the workplace changes um, as they have more knowledge um, and as, as the situation um, you know, continues to develop. So it could be that you reach a point where you want to stop and either that's because it's just become too difficult or because yeah. you've got other priorities that you want to um, focus on, whether that's being with family and members or, or something else that's really important to you that you're just reprioritizing at that point. 
So, yeah, um, very much a personal decision, I think, led by circumstance as much as anything else. Thank you. Because I think for some people, work is the only thing that makes them realise they're not a cancer patient, they're not dying. It's just yeah. a lot of sense of autonomy. And I think off the back of COVID, working from home, you can have a laptop on your hospice bed, you can plug into the Wi-Fi and still potentially feel you're doing something that's not purely to do with your illness or your treatment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's also something that a person would want to talk to their HR team about as well to see um, what they might do and, and when and they'll be able to support that person. And also just talk to them about some of the financial aspects, which can be a concern as well. Yeah. So, you know, things like your pension um, and, and also they can signpost you to other support as well. So definitely worth a conversation with them to make sure you're, you're as supported and knowledgeable as you can be. And getting all the benefits you're entitled to, because a lot of us don't know what you're eligible for as illnesses. Oh. I didn't with mum. It's like, oh, we get money from this and we get money from that. And I had no idea. No, so, no, no. We're not no. experts in this, are we? And often you're too afraid to ask those questions. So, yeah, yeah. people don't ask them until they reach a point where it is. it's come front and centre, I think. It just, it's almost it's asking them early so you can get the paperwork done in yeah. time and things like blue badges and what do you do and all of that so yeah. it's great yeah. to know you can help with all of that can you tell us a bit about the compassionate employers program yes definitely um i think that was in response to understanding that it can be hard for people to know just where to start with talking to an employer once they have um, been given a diagnosis of a life limiting condition or they're finding that caring responsibilities are really stepping up um, and becoming um, much more um, in the centre of their lives. Yeah. So the Compassionate Employers Programme is our workplace wellbeing programme, um, and it's designed to help organisations to look after their people um, and support employees dealing with caring, with grief, with the impact of a life-limiting illness. So it's there not just for the HR side um, of an organisation, it's also very much for employees and employers as well, so that people feel confident and capable of supporting um, colleagues in, in what can be challenging and, and emotional times. Um, and we do that, that programme by providing advice and support from bereavement experts to, to workplaces so that they are prepared um, to support people with those diagnoses or changing circumstances. Um, and those organisations that have signed up to the scheme have access to um, online resources 24 seven, as well as um, dedicated expertise too. Um, so there's, there's, a, what is, there's a whole raft of tools and knowledge there that employers and employees can draw upon to support them. And is that helping patients as well as partners and parents? Or is it just um, a patient? No, it is designed for people who who are living with a life limiting condition. Okay. So yes, it, it's the whole range um, yeah. of people who might be living with that illness themselves alongside those who are caring for them or supporting them in other ways. Um, and equally, colleagues who um, are having to come to terms with somebody perhaps not being at their desk all the time as they might have been at one point. So that's put in it and who it's 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 often harder being the friend of someone who's going through this and you don't know who do you talk to and where do you mm -hmm. go for mm -hmm. to help them. How can you find out if your employer is in the Compassionate Employers Programme? Get in touch with us and um, we have a fantastic team who'd be delighted to have a chat with you um, and find out if your employer is part of the scheme or talk to you about um, how your employer might get involved. So absolutely. Um, email us okay. get in touch find out and if they're not they can get on it i think it's so important we need to realize that people with cancer want to work and you have to be able to have gentle but honest conversations to help everybody absolutely. go through absolutely yes brilliant thank you so what are hospice uk's plans for the future oh right if i had to say it in a nutshell um it's about ensuring that hospices can survive and thrive um in what with using the, the challenging word are, are in fact challenging times on many fronts um and we're also just we're just working to make sure that that hospice care is there for your family um now and for the future as well thank you no this this may come as shock to some people but Hospices aren't funded by the government. No. Well, they were... A little bit. Can you tell us how much money roughly a hospice needs to raise every day? 
I will need to remind myself of that figure and email it to you afterwards because I always get it wrong. <laughs> so I have a mental <laughs> problem. My, 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 my local hospice in various St Edmunds, I think, had to raise £12,000 every day to provide all the services. It does. Twelve grand a day. They rely on charitable donations, don't they? Predominantly. They absolutely are reliant on their communities. Um, then they get a percentage of funding from the government, yeah. um, but the vast majority of funding is coming from um, the communities that the hospices support. And yeah, I will email you directly after this with the figure no, that I have made a note of. It just gets so sad because this is such an important part. Every single person is going to die. And this is another question. I I asked a load of nurses where they wanted to die, at home, a hospital, or in a hospice, and almost all said at home or in a hospice. And then I said, how many beds are there for your catchment area? And there's something like eight or 12 adult beds for a population of a quarter of a million. Yes, that's why things like the virtual wards are really important yes. as well, because they can offer that level of enhanced support. Um, yes. That means that um, people can stay in their own homes and don't have to be admitted to hospital or indeed to a hospice in order to access the support that they need. Which is brilliant. But it just made me think if you are and you have to be well enough to go into a hospice bed, because sometimes it, they, they, there aren't the space for you, you can be too poorly to go in, sadly. But people who think a hospice bed will be available for them, we need to donate, don't we? You need to raise money for your local hospice just to help keep them going. So they are there if and when you may need it. Absolutely. We need to um, support our hospices just to, to do the fantastic work that they're doing. Be that a bed in the unit, but very much more so also in the community, um, supporting people and into bereavement as well. So there's that that whole array of services that wrap around people at such a critical point in their lives and make the biggest difference. It really does. Are there any changes you'd like to see in the UK to improve the quality of life for someone who is coming towards the end? I think um, you might have read that um, it's something like one in four families in the UK can't get the care that they need and that, and that they deserve when a loved one is dying. Mm -hmm. So we are very much on a mission to make sure that hospice care is there, no matter where you live, what illness you have, who you are, um, hospice care will be there. Is it worse in areas of deprivation? Because we heard from the CRUK report this week that 33,000 33, cancers are due to deprivation. Um, that is one I will need to check in with my policy, our policy team about. Certainly hospices are working very hard um, with the communities that um, are in deprived areas to support them. And there, there's some really innovative work going on um, to enable them to respond to just things like cost of living support um, as much, you know, that practical side of things as much as anything else as, as the actual physical care that they might provide. And I guess it's getting that information out there that there is help available. Yes. You, you can yes. or you don't need to do this alone because if it's not something that's talked about in your culture, you may not know even what a hospice is. So just trying to get it out there. It's yes, yes. So hospices increasingly have community connectors, I suppose, to yeah. engage with communities who haven't really seen that hospice care um, is a good fit with how um they they like to support family members um, just to, to help people see what the difference can make and that that support can be um, culturally appropriate. That might not be the right phrase, but but that responds to the, the beliefs um, and um, what's important to people of different communities and, and so on. That's brilliant to know. And is there anything else you'd like to add about the work of Hospice UK that we haven't covered today? No, hopefully I've conveyed that um, we do a lot um, and I hope that, that we're doing that brilliantly to support um, local hospices um, and to help members of the public have those really important conversations um, so that they can be prepared and um, family members can know about the wishes um, of those who are close to them, which brings a comfort in itself. Yeah, it really does. Thank you so much. And again, if working with cancer can help support Hospice UK, we just need to get the word out there and help. So thank you so much for talking to me today, Melanie. It's been really, really interesting. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for your time. Thank you.